Hey, future respiratory therapists. I've been getting lots of messages here lately about um, dead space and alveolar vo tidal volume and minute ventilation and things like that. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to break this down. Now, I felt like I've already done something like this, but I can't find it. And if I can't find it, then you definitely can't find it. So let's put it out there and make it readily accessible for everybody to find. Now, if you're in your first semester or you just wrapped up your first semester and you're moving into your second semester and you're about to start learning mechanical ventilation, you've got to understand these concepts. Now, if you're in your, if you just graduated and you don't understand these concepts, you need to understand them, okay? If you're in your second or third or fourth semester of a four-year program and you don't understand these concepts, you got to grasp this, guys. This is important stuff, okay? So pay attention to what's about to happen. I appreciate all of you watching. If at the end of this you appreciate the content I put out, I'd appreciate a subscribe from you. I'd also appreciate and answer all comments that you post, every single one of them, okay? So please uh, engage and interact with the channel. And, uh, and let's just make it a live channel for everybody to benefit from, okay? So here we go. We're going to jump into this. What we have on the board here is nothing more than a six-foot male, okay? Now, what we know about six-foot males, if nothing else, then you know you can calculate ideal body weight. Now, if you calculate ideal body weight for a six-foot male, then you get 178 pounds. That is not a hashtag. That is the pounds signal, okay, or the pounds symbol. Now, what we know is important about this as respiratory therapists is that we know that 178 pounds of ideal body weight equates to an approximation of anatomical dead space, okay? So we can say approximately this patient has 178 milliliters of ideal body weight, okay? Now let's make this come to life. You have this patient, two different scenarios here, okay, but the same patient. Nothing else is different. One is breathing 30 times a minute, and they're breathing a tidal volume of 250. The other is breathing uh, 14 times a minute with a tidal volume of 500 milliliters. Now, where we start with this is what I consider to be the most fundamental, most basic, most important formula that you must understand as a respiratory therapist. This formula is going to come into play every single time you step into uh, the room of a patient, specifically the room of an intubated patient where you have controlled rates and controlled tidal volumes or you have a patient breathing spontaneously on mechanical ventilator. You have to understand minute ventilation. Now we know that that formula tells us that minute ventilation equals respiratory rate times tidal volume. Now, if we do that right here, we'll get something like this. 30 times 250 equals 7.5 liters. Now, if you did 30 times 250, you got 7,500 milliliters. We turn that into liters and we get 7.5 liters. Now, if you do 14 times 500, you will get 7 liters, okay? 7,000 milliliters depending on if you turned it into to liters prior to or after to doing the formula. Now, the question I have right here at this point is if everything else is the same, which of these patients is removing more car carbon dioxide or is more effectively removing CO2? That's my question I have, and that's what this video is going to help illustrate for you today. Okay, now... To answer that question, many of us would probably say, well, this person has a higher minute ventilation, so 7.5 is greater than 7, so we're going to say that 7.5 is removing more carbon dioxide. Some of you may look at it and go, well, this person's breathing more, so that means they're removing more. Some of you may look at it and go, well, this person has a bigger tidal volume, so that means they're removing more. Now, if I was to ask you this, I would say it has nothing to do with rate or tidal volume, even though it around the by way it does. But if you were to say the tidal volume, I would ask you why. If you were to say the rate, I would ask you why. And this is the importance in understanding that hyperventilation and even CO2 removal has nothing to do with rate or tidal volume, has everything to do with minute ventilation, okay? Except for at the end of this, you're gonna see where one of them plays a bigger role in this equation, 
okay so let's jump into it now to figure out and break this down the way I would expect my students to do is I would expect them to do this okay tell me why 7.5 liters has a greater CO2 removal than 7 liters or why does this patient patient B have a greater removal of CO2 than patient A okay and what I would expect to see is something like this we know we have an anatomical dead space of 178 okay now if we have a if we have an anatomical dead space of 178 then we understand that we have to take that off of our tidal volume you see because what dead space tells you is that this is the amount of gas that is not participating with gas exchange so the patient may be taking in a tidal volume of 250 but it doesn't mean that 250 milliliters are participating with gas exchange and that's really all that matters okay so what we have to do is we have to subtract our anatomical dead space from our our, tide, our total tidal volume so if we do 250 minus 178 we get 250 minus 178 this person has an alveolar tidal volume of 72 mls now if we were to break this down on the other side and go 500 minus 178 we would see that this person has an alveolar tidal volume of 322 so I'm going to circle this because this is very important okay this person has an alveolar tidal volume of 72 mls this person has an alveolar tidal volume of 322 mls now let me tell you how this might else be asked of you okay and I'm gonna do this throughout the entire process what you see here is if I asked you patient A here this is patient A this is patient B if I ask you patient A how much of their tidal volume is ineffective you would say 178 of patient B how much of their tidal volume is ineffective you would say 178 if I asked you how much volume of patient A is dead space you would say 178 and if I asked you how much volume of dead space is this patient B have you would say 178 now what I'm trying to do is illustrate to you how the terminology of of dead space and ineffective gas exchange how they relate to one another okay if somebody asks you anatomical dead space what they're referring to is how much of the volume of the tidal volume is ineffective now if they're asking volumes in milliliters then you take the 178 178 okay they could ask this another way and ask you for a percentage which I'm going to talk about in just a second but before I move on let me clarify this if I was to ask you of patient A their tidal volume is 250 they're a six foot male approximately how much of their tidal volume is effective you would say 72 milliliters why because 72 milliliters of the 250 is actually participating in gas exchange if I was to ask you on patient B how much of the 500 ml tidal volume is effective you should say 322 mls is effective because that means it's participating in gas exchange okay now let's do this in a percentage standpoint now when we talk about this we're talking about VD to VT and when we do that we have to say 178 divided by 250 equals I believe it's 71 percent but let me double check is 71 percent so what percent of this person's tidal volume is dead space? 71%. What percent, what, what percent of this person, patient A, of their tidal volume is ineffective? Meaning it doesn't participate in gas exchange. Your answer is 71%. Now when we do this on this side, we see we get a VT of, of uh, 178 divided by 500 and we get 35 
percent. So this person has of the tidal volume they are breathing in, 35% of it is ineffective. So how much is ineffective? 35% in, in states of percentages. How much in states of volumes and mil, in milliliters? 178 milliliters, okay? Now, if you understand how much is ineffective, then you can equate how much is effective. So if you can calculate and understand, this, this formula right here gives you ineffective or dead space percentage, then you understand that the rest of the percentage is effective. So if we look at this person, then we know that they have a 29% effective tidal volume. That means 29% of this 250 is effective. If I do, if I do 250 times 0.29, guess what I get? 72 mLs. You see, only 72 mLs are effective or 29% is effective. Over here, if 35% is not effective or ineffective or dead space, then we know that 65% is effective or is participating with gas exchange or is what I like to call a live space. Now, don't ever say that in a clinic setting or probably to any of your instructors. When I say a live space, I try to say it to you so you can equate a live space to dead space. Dead space does not participate with gas exchange. A live space does participate with gas exchange. No way, no form is that a medical term. It's just a, it's just a way I try to get students to understand, okay? So I wanna illustrate that first, okay? Now, I wanna give you a visual of what I'm talking about right here, okay? So I'm gonna erase this. I'm going to draw two sets of lungs. And on this side, going in, we have 250 mLs tidal volume. But getting lost in the dead space is 178 of it, which leaves 72 to get to the alveoli. Okay, 72 mLs. Okay, what do we say? Roughly 29% of the 250 mLs. You can see that this 250 mLs, most of it is being lost in anatomical dead space. Now over here we have 500 going in. We're losing 178 in the conducting airways, which is where dead space happens. Everything from your nasal pharynx to your oral pharynx to your pharynx to your larynx to your upper airways and your conducting airways. That's where this is lost. This is the anatomical dead space we're talking about. Now the end result, if we put in 500 or if the patient takes in 500 and they lose 178, then we know that we have 322 mLs going to alveolar regions where gas exchange happens. Okay, so that's the visual for you. So you understand what I'm talking about when I say tidal volume of 500, but you're losing 178. You're losing 178 in those conducting airways, okay? And it reveals and leaves for you your alveolar tidal volumes, okay? Now watch this, because I still don't think I have explained which one of these patients would be removing more CO2. This person has a minute ventilation of 7.5. This one has seven. Seems like this one would be removing more CO2, but let's break it down and let me show you why that's not the case, okay? So I'm gonna erase this. And what we're gonna do here is we're going to take our alveolar tidal volume right here, 72 and 322. Now, remember the minute ventilation formula? Respiratory rate times tidal volume equals minute ventilation. Well, guess what? Respiratory rate times alveolar tidal volume equals alveolar minute ventilation. And alveolar minute ventilation is the minute ventilation that actually results in CO2 removal. So while this is misleading, oh, this one definitely removes more CO2 because it's removing, has a higher minute ventilation, Let's see what happens when we look at alveolar minute ventilation. Now, if our alveolar tidal volume is 72 and we multiply that times 30, we are going to get 
72 times 30 gives us 2,160, which is 2.16 liters. And we're going to call this alveolar minute ventilation. Okay? Now over here, we're going to do 322 times 14. And we are going to get 322 times 14 is 4,508, which is 4.5 liters. And this is our alveolar minute ventilation over here. Now, when we compare these numbers, we see that the patient over here who has a smaller minute ventilation actually has a more effective alveolar minute ventilation. And this is going to equate to more effective removal of CO2 versus this patient, patient A, who had a higher minute ventilation, but because their tidal volume was so small, most of it was lost in dead space, which means the effective amount was very little, which means their effective minute ventilation or alveolar minute ventilation is less than what our patient B has with a smaller overall minute ventilation. Okay, so patient B would actually be removing more CO2 because they have a more effective alveolar minute ventilation. Let me say it another way. Patient B would remove more CO2 because they have a more effective minute ventilation. I can say it another way. Patient B is removing more CO2 because they have more amount of their total minute volume actually participating in gas exchange. Okay, I hope that makes sense. Now, before I leave, we're gonna do one more thing here. I'm gonna show you something cool here, okay? If you remember when we did the VD to VT on patient A, we got 71%, okay? When we did uh, patient B, we got 35%. Now, let me show you how cool this is, okay? If you take 71% of 7.5, that's ineffective, okay? So how much is actually effective? Well, if 71% is effective, then 29%, I'm sorry, 71% is ineffective, then 29% is effective. And if 35% is ineffective, then 65% is effective. Okay, now watch this. Our initial title, our initial minute volume over here was 7.5 liters times 29% effective rate is point times 0.29 gives us 2.17, which is what I got here if I would have rounded correctly up here. Now, when I do 65% of 7 liters, I do 7 times 0.65, and guess what I get? 4.5 liters, and it equ equates to be the same. So guys, what you got to understand is understand that VD to VT, what does it tell you about your patient? It tells you how much of the volume of gas, VD to VT is a percentage. It tells you how much is ineffective. You can equate that to your minute volume to find out how much of your minute volume is ineffective. Whatever's left over from your ineffective amount equates to your effective amount, okay? And normal VD to VT is 20 to 40%. Anything greater than that, you're at risk of hypoventilating your patients because the amount of tidal volume that is left over after the dead space is accounted for is not enough effective tidal volume to adequately remove CO2. I hope this makes sense. I hope I earned your subscription and I hope you put a comment down below because I'd love to have a discourse with you over this, okay? Hey guys, hope everybody's staying safe. Hope you enjoy your break between, between the spring semester and the summer semester and I wish everybody the best and best and best of best wishes.